So I'm going to talk today about how we believe the MMOs developed over the last 10 years, where we are today, and what we're going to do about the future of MMOs back at Boston, right? Beginning 3,000 years before the birth of Christ, we were playing Senate, which is the first game we know about. Uh, Senate is made of a board divided into squares, and you throw numerical sticks to find out in which square your character is going to land on. And upon landing on that square, an effect is triggered that sets you forward or backwards in your ultimate goal of reaching the afterlife before uh, your playmate, your, your, your opponent. Fast forward 5,000 years to the early 20th century, we have Monopoly, right? It's a, bo it's a board divided into squares where you throw numerical dices to find out where your character is going to land, and depending on where he lands, an effect is triggered to set you forward or backwards in your search to become the richest man around the table. I hope there's no one from Hasbro here to hate my talk. Anyway, so for, the point is for millennia, games were confined by the board and the rules that enforced how you behave inside those boards. If you change any of that, you were essentially creating a new game. You couldn't allow, you're not allowed the freedom to, to play in a different way. That is until the 70s when Dungeons and Dragons came about and it changed everything as far as games are concerned. Now, the rules moved from the board into the player's imagination. The limitation of what players can do is no longer written down, is, is in their heads, is what they can imagine they can do. It's so free-formed that players have more fun when they subvert the rules, beating the DM with the unexpected, than when they're actually do throwing dices and doing what they're supposing to do. Basically, these games set players free to play as they see fit. And the 70s being the 70s, all about computers, the next step is that D&D made its way into UK and US universities through uh, text-based adventures such as uh, Colossal Cave. And a couple of years later, uh, MUDs came about, which is the multi-user dungeons, essentially taking the experience to multiplayer across networks. And for the first time, we can now emulate the experience we had around the table across vast distances, even uh, if we don't live in the same country. And then in 97, things got really serious for MMOs. You can trace back the origin of MMO as we know from Ultima Online, which you just heard a little bit about on the previous presentation. Everybody loved this game. Now, thanks to games like Ultima Online, RuneScape, EVE, and World of Warcraft, MMOs became a huge industry. I don't need to tell you that. You all know how successful it has been. But uh, when he was born here in Ultima Online, it was very different from what it is today. Ultima was very rough about the edges because it was one of the first ones to come about and establish the rules that today we take for granted, like guilds, PvP, and raids, and, and whatnot. Because it was very rough about the ed around the edges, players could do things they were not supposed to. In fact, in Ultima, they were free in a sense, more free in a sense than they are today playing similar MMOs because we didn't know any better, right? So you might ask me why I'm here talking about MMOs. Uh, I'm known for creating a game where you are a surgeon doing surgery in the back of an ambulance hitting potholes or a piece of bread who wants to become toast. But I have been making online games for more than 30 years, uh, online trading card games, uh, even working on a bird. I was lucky enough to be in the team of RuneScape. My co-founder of the studio is the former head of RuneScape, in fact. I work it in, in, in Facebook with FIFA, FIFA Superstars at Playfish, and Boss's first game, uh, Monster Mine, was the first real-time multiplayer game on Facebook. And we are now working on, of course, Worlds of Drift, which is a massive uh, MMO. So, because we love MMOs so much, I was there when it happened, I saw MMOs evolving over time, we found ourselves talking about MMOs when lunch times in the pubs and discussing what do you think about the future of them. And one of the things that I realized is that every time we talk about our memories in MMOs, what we actually treasure about them, we are talking about something that was not expected to happen. The memorable moments that we have on our heads, when we had the most fun, it was when something went wrong. And then we found out that this is true for mainstream as well. The chapters in histories of MMOs that everybody shared, like specific great moments, they were all chapters when something 
it didn't work the way it was supposed to work. Like Lord British, Richard Garrett, uh, 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 die into the game when a, a player exploited the bug on a spell, or uh, when the players in EverQuest decided to kill Carafirm, which Sony never expected to be possible to do, or when the Corrupted Plague escaped its confines in uh, World of Warcraft, and all of a sudden it was killing entire players dead, uh, entire servers dead, and painting the cities white with the skeletons of their characters, right? So, in a much more micro scale, this happens to every player. The moments they treasure about their experiences online is when they somehow manage to subvert the order of things, when they do things that were not expected to happen. And then MMOs, of course, become big business, and we all start to look into what's going on. We develop tools, such analytics, to understand the best, the behavior of the players. And I think we made a very, very big mistake. Because one of the first findings we had was about churn, when people were leaving MMOs was about their dying or they incurring great losses. If a player dies unexpectedly and he loses everything he was carrying, he will rage quit. And we got around, all of us as an industry, and we say, how do we fix this? Well, let's protect the player. Let's limit what the player uh, uh, can lose. So we created things like no PvP zones, or we create instances where we subtract the players from interacting with people we don't want them to. Or we created, uh, uh, we banned exploits and, and why not. And in the process of doing this, we subtracted all the freedom for players to do things they were not supposed to do. We insulated the players. Well, the problem is the more safety you create, eventually the less freedom you will have. And we extended this concept up to the point it became dogma. No MMO can kill players arbitrarily. PVP, or oh, players hate PVP if it's not consensual. We started to create these rules and assume that no game online could be developed breaking any of these rules. And the result is that players today call most MMOs, few exceptions, EVE is a very good exception of this, uh, they call them theme parks because they feel they're strapped to a ride which they can deviate very little from. They feel like they are not free to improvise and do things they're not supposed to do. And this, I think, is the ultimate irony. MMOs evolve in the, in the direction which is essentially against what sparked their birth in the first place, the freedom of our players to do as they please. This is what proves the point. Minecraft is the antithesis of MMO dogma. Here's a game that does everything that MMO game design has told us in the past 10 years you cannot do. You enter the game, there's no NPC to tell you what to do. You don't have objectives. You have to come up with your own goals. Then, as, as, as soon as the sun sets, you better find shelter or you're going to die. And if you die, you're going to lose everything that you're carrying with you. Don't care. And yet, if you go on, on YouTube and see how many Minecraft videos exist, there's 150 million videos of people playing Minecraft. That's more videos than every other major MMO combined on YouTube. So how can you explain using MMO dogma that this game is successful. You can't, which means that MMO dogma can't be right as well. And I will illustrate one more point. Thanks wow. to Minecraft, <clears throat> a whole generation of players... you do players, is you put it in oh, the here like this. So thank you. Uh, thanks to Minecraft, a whole generation of players grew up, don't, they don't care about loss. They don't care about dying. They're having fun when things go wrong. And why? because they are free to choose. When they are free to choose, when things go wrong, it's their fault, it's not the game's fault. And because the, 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 the rules of this game are so tight, they understand the risk they're incurring when they make a decision. If I'm gonna dig to the bottom of the world, I, will, I may fall into love and I will lose everything. It's a decision that the player makes. And here, here is, the, is the kicker. This is so true that the first video that, go, that went viral from Minecraft is when something went wrong. The first video that most people recognize Minecraft by is when something unexpected happened. This is the video I want to I show you in that uh, a player is uh, streaming, on, streaming uh, on YouTube showing the house that his flatmate built the night before. And of course, things don't go according to plan. And then set a fire to it. Now, not always, but most of... Uh -oh. Crap. 
Sorry guys, and this is not supposed to happen. Oh my god. <laughs> um, crap. Oh, no way. Um, yeah. What the hell just happened? So, there you go. Uh, went wrong and people love the game because of the potential freedom, the potential scope of things unexpected happen. And Minecraft is what everybody in this room know it is today. So this is what I think one of the reasons why MMOs are not growing anymore. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the vast majority of MMOs are past their prime in, ter in terms of peak number of players uh, enjoying them, right? It's simply because a generation of gamers who grew up used to the idea that they can do as they please, they can change the world around them, that they can come up with their own objectives, simply will not accept having to walk to an NPC that will ask him to go and kill 10 rats, to bring the tails back, so they will be rewarded XP to rinse and repeat that in a different setting. This is just limiting, it's too limited for them. They will not accept that. And this is why these games exist now. This is a whole new genre, the survival game, that was spoken about today, like Rust and DayZ, that bring the same elements that made Minecraft great. Crafting, survival, damaging, uh, limiting risk by yourself, uh, taking risks with your friends, and open gameplay with no objectives, nothing set in stone. You go on and, and, and do what you want. Every single one of these titles, and a dozen more like them, they are multi-million selling unit uh, 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 franchises right now, made mostly by small studios. But none of them is a massive multiplayer game. There is no massive multiplayer in the market right now which is built on these tenets, these things that we know that work because of Minecraft and because of survival games. And this, this is why we decided to create Worlds of Drift, which is what I'm going to talk to you about. So, Worlds of Drift was born like every other game at, at, at Bossa on, a, on our monthly game jams. We stop 48 hours every month, all the teams gather, uh, all the teams stop what they're working, and they form in small units of five or six people. And we create around five or six playable prototypes per month, which we all try. And every year, out of the 60 or so games that we create in, those, in, in that framework, one or two become projects, like Surgeon Simulator and I Am Brad, that we sit to launch. In Worlds of Drift, the jam theme was multiplayer games that you will play as a hobby. Now, this immediately became a problem because no one else at the studio played MMOs. We all loved the idea of MMOs, but we found out all of a sudden that no one in the team of 30 people were regularly playing MMOs anymore. And then we started to go back and find out why that is, when we stopped playing MMOs. And we have to go as far back as Ultima Online, and then we make the discovery that uh, something got lost along the way from pen and paper RPG to where we are today. And in that process, we created six pillars on which we've started to build Worlds of Drift around. So the first pillar is to set the players free. With today's technology, we can do pretty much anything we want in, in, as long as uh, games are, uh, are concerned. So why not do this, since we have been proven by Minecraft and others and survival games that when they are free to craft whatever they want, the way they want, they enjoy the game much better. And if they building things that they use inside the game with their own shape, with their own purpose, they are investing emotional uh, capital into that, which makes a huge impact in retention uh, and engagement with the title. Not only that, this generates free content for us. Because we allow players to craft things in any shape or form they want, they can build things that suit their style of gameplay. So suppose in Wars of Drift you decide to be a pirate and you want to build, using the example of the ships that fly in, uh, um, from island to island, if you are a pirate, you want to make a ship which is very fast, so you can hit and run very fast, you load it with a lot of engines. Right? If you are a bounty hunter, you load it with 
a lot of cannons because you want to threat other people uh, and, and take them into uh, a bounty or whatnot. If you are a trader, you probably want a much larger ship with plating to defend you and whatnot. Or if you want to do a different role, you come up with what you want to do. This is content that the players create for themselves to follow their own objectives. And by doing so, since there's no prescribed way to do anything, we soon see people sharing their concepts, their best ideas, their best practices on Reddit, on YouTube, on Twitch, uh, and whatnot, which in turn create free marketing for us. So it's a game that is free formed, enable people to create free content, and because of that content, as uh, Alex was saying today about how people watch the builds in Rust, what is the kind of builds that you're, you're, you're making with your game, the same thing happens when you allow them to freely craft. So the second pillar is risk versus reward. In order for the freedom that we gave the players to make any sense, <clears throat> there have to be consequences for their actions. Right? So this is when I was talking about if you, if you understand the risk you are incurring, you are fine with the consequences, whatever the consequences are. So in World of Drift, we got away with the whole concept of uh, no PVP zones or uh, safety uh, arti made artificially by a system on, on the game. So much so that even the weather is trying to kill you. Everything is against you. But because it's a very in intuitive and natural set of rules, it's not something that we created by design, uh, 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 an arbitrary thing such as no PvP zones, we have to click a button or be in a specific place, none of that. It's all very intuitive. And the players understand by intuition what are the risks they are incurring. And they are fine with that. So the, the lesson from this one is that you shouldn't, be, you shouldn't be afraid of putting the players at risk. And this has been proven by survival games like DZ and H1Z1, and et cetera. Those games are all about risk all the time, and they are fine. The players never feel uh, they are out of control. So the third pillar is one of my favorites, is about permanence. Once we created freedom and consequences, the next natural step is for us to record those consequences forever and for everybody. In Worlds of Drift, everything is permanent. Every rock, every creature, a tree, if you move them around, change their position, that will be the new state of that thing forever. The time-lapse video that you saw there, you saw a ship crashing into an island, uh, getting blown to pieces into hundreds of different parts that the players built themselves to, to craft that ship. And then, in the course of two days, another crew got, got to that island and started salvaging those parts to build their new ship, which they fly away on. So, every time something happens in Worlds of Drift, because it's recorded forever, it creates content, it creates stories. The side effect of that is that no two visits to the same place are always the same. You have been there before, you go there again, it has been changed by the players who have been there and done their thing. Maybe they cut down the trees, maybe they killed the entire creatures that are on that island. But that makes it so that the content is much more reusable. And players, as they play, are creating content all the time. Imagine, for instance, that Twitcher is playing Worlds Adrift with permanence, and he got shot, and his ship falls from the sky into an island. Everybody saw that on the stream. Now they can fly to that island and see the result of that scene. They can go there and interact with those pieces themselves. It's the first time an MMO integrates with, with the way the players are seeing and experiencing games on Twitch like this. So the big lesson for permanence is that with permanence, <clears throat> the content of your game goes up daily. 
without you having to produce content yourself. Every time players play, they are creating content that gets recorded on the game, and thus the game is always changing every day. So the fourth pillar gave us some pause. It's about the freedom to let players shape the world. I'm not talking about a mod here where you might create a level that players might download and experience or not. I'm, I'm talking about the players helping us create the world that every other player will share, the game that we're gonna launch. So we made a tool, made it available for players, but we didn't even know if they will be able to create to the same quality that we expected them to or that we could create into uh, the, whole, the studio itself. And of course, we were horrified of what would be the, the, the TTP of, of uh, giving such a tool to players. So TTP is time to penis, right? We all know that when we give players the tools, they create things that we don't expect them to. Now, not only we were pleasantly surprised that no one of them uh, made the penis-shaped uh, island, actually it was our team who did the, the, the only one we had in the game, uh, but the islands they started to create were much better than any island that we did internally. We not even launched the game, and we already have 2,000 islands of quality that we could not match ourselves with level designers in the studio that will form the world that's gonna launch next. Imagine how this affects game production. So the lesson that we have learned from this is that by intuition, we assume that players who are engaged will be able to create something of very high quality. But we never expected them to beat us to the quality and get so engaged to a game that has not even been launched yet. This is something that I have never expected and it turns out it happened. The fifth pillar is called the physical world. This is what we are known at Boss as like a trademark in that surgeon has four million or so videos on YouTube and you're gonna ask, well, why is that? Is a game about doing surgery, why there are so many videos on YouTube about it? It's because it's a physical game. Every time someone kills or saves a patient in that game, they do it in a completely different way. When right at the last second, they're doing the heart transplant and the ambulance hit a pothole and the, the heart falls all of his hand and roll into the pavement. That only happened that way for that particular player. So every video they push to YouTube is a very different video of the same game and thus valid content to be enjoyed. So if you take that to a new level on an MMO, you create something which is quite, quite special. World of Drift takes physics to a very new level by pairing it with crafting. Imagine that not only you can now craft whatever you want, like structures, ships, guns, or whatever, but all of that is physical, which means that every time you use it, every time something interacts with one another, is unpredictable the result. Therefore, the content is again expanded into very close to infinity. I'll give you a quick example of how far this can go. We have this um, weekly session at, at the studio where we created ships to battle each other. And we all armed the ship to the teeth with uh, cannons and plating and, and so on to blast the hell out of each other. Then I saw someone building a ship with no cannons and no plating at all. And he was piling rocks on top of the deck of the ship. When the battle started, he flew that ship over every other ship, tilted it over, and the rocks fell over the crews below, killing everybody there, without one single fire of a shot, uh, one shot being fired. Now, we never coded this, we never scripted this, we never expected this, that this was possible. Physics enabled it to, do, to happen. 
Now imagine that in a scale of hundreds of thousands of players, the amount of stuff that they can come up with, the strategy they will be able to develop over time. So if you are to create an MMO which has physicality on it, you are essentially creating the possibility of the players to create content uh, uh, that you never expected to be possible or anticipated that will happen. It makes the life cycle of the game much longer. So here is the last pillar, which is what we call skill-based gameplay. Should be natural, but imagine an MMO with no XP, no leveling up. It's all back from the character into the player. Why? Because evolution on the character is kept. When a character reaches the maximum level that your designer and content creators put into the game, there's nowhere for that character to go unless your team goes back there and expand that level with a new expansion pack or new areas or whatnot. When we remove that from the equation and put the skill back into the player, that's, again, infinite. Players do play Counter-Strike 20 years on, and they're still perfecting the way that they shoot each other in the head. This is the same thing here. What you saw is the most basic uh, uh, action you can do in the game, which is transpose space. I'm going from A to B. And even that is a skill that you can master. Now, if you expand that into crafting, flying ships, jumping, shooting, you all of a sudden have a set of skills that are essentially endless, that the players will be able to max out only if they, in their lifetime. They will die without being, uh, uh, reaching the end of the possibilities of, of that gameplay. Imagine how, how good this will do for production. You're not having to care too anymore about having to build new areas or new skills and, and running out of this content, right? The payoff Right now, for us, is that very easy for us to differentiate World of Dream from every other MMO by just saying, oh, there's no XP, there's no grinding, which, by the way, play players hate so much that they create tools to automate that task when they're having dinner. But it puts us in a market position that is unique. Of course, I hope that this will not be the case for very long as people start to uh, go back to, to skill-based if, if we prove that this is the right way to do. But don't underestimate how much locked in the mentality we got on looking at MMOs uh, all about XP and leveling up and investing on the character. Investing on the player, as far as we have seen, is probably a very, very useful route to take. So I have spoken about all these pillars, and there is one, one last point I wanted you guys to take away with, which is Water Drift has been in production for two years now. Uh, most of these two years was only 10 people working on it. The team now is around 20 people, most. And the game is on alpha. There is a few thousand of people playing it every week. And we're going to release it in a few months. Now, we are about to ship an MMO, which hopefully will change a little bit the status quo of uh, online games. That was developed under a budget similar to a, a mobile game. And the, the trick for us to do that is a very, very simple one is shifting from content production to systems production. Now, when Gary Gygax created Dungeons and Dragons, he didn't create a world. He created a frame set for the players to create their own worlds in there. When Notch created Minecraft, he didn't put NPCs to give the players quests or objectives or anything like that. He created a landscape with resources that you could harvest and build upon. Those are all systems. And the beauty of systems is that they are exponential. If you build two or three systems and they interact well together, and you build a fourth one, you are not expanding the game by, 20, by a quarter. You are expanding a, a game by 10, 20 fold, because that system interacts with all the others that enable much more content to be generated because of those systems. Uh, this is the mindset that we hope that the industry should now, on MMOs, uh, could now take, given the technology that is available today at our disposal. But if we don't let go from the rules that got us here, uh, we will not be able to do that. We have to look at these problems in a very kind of uh, innocent or um, uh, unjaded way, if you wish. And uh, that's me. Thank you very much.